do uh, good things as we as we exit today. So, um, so last week we started with um, moral or uh, adverse selection. So, who can characterize for me what adverse selection was? Not everybody wants hold. Oh, just hold back here. Okay, here you go. Problems because the way that the wheel set up that attracts the wrong type of people. Okay, yeah. So the track tracks. Yeah, it's good. You remember the pre-contract, post-contract stuff. Good. I think I I didn't ever actually think of it that way until I took a class. Actually, until I was teaching. You learn a lot of stuff when you're teaching this stuff, by the way. So um, that kind of clicked with me. Post-contract, pre-contract. So I think that's kind of helpful to think about it. So here we are, um, when we say contract, so we're doing an exchange, we're buying an insurance policy, we're going to a restaurant, whatever. We're engaging in exchange. There's a, there's a trade of money, right? It's the transaction date, the contract. And so prior to that, this is kind of pre-contract. And then ahead of that is post contract. And the main concept that we're dealing with in, uh, in, this, in these chapters, all the way through to the end, the last chapter as well, the principal agent problem, is the problem of asymmetric information. So asymmetric information means the buyer and the seller don't have equal information. So asymmetric information implies buyer and seller don't have equal information. The buyer knows more than the seller. Okay. The buyer knows more than the seller or the seller knows more than the buyer. So the classic case of inside information with a stock tip or something, uh, you'd be the buyer and somebody who's selling the stock doesn't know that there's going to be some new information released next week that's going to be high. They wouldn't sell it if they knew that information, but a new buyer has it, right? That sounds like the thing we want to do in a market system. Like, let's have more information than the other guy. And in fact, we do want to do that, but the groping around by individuals who are looking out for their own best interests ends up um, creating an efficient price system and though that information eventually gets out in some cases more so than others uh, quicker uh, depending on the type of good like if we're talking about um, beer like we might be talking about tonight on our little excursion uh, or houses right so if we talk about real estate you know what's the difference between real estate and beer which one's more complex Real estate, right? I mean, it's just like infinitely more complex. And so it's difficult to compare one house to the other because uh, there's three important things in real estate that I learned as a young uh, realtor. Location. And what's the second one? Location. And what's the third one? Location, right? So almost by default, we have a different setup just through location alone on top of all the other things that could be different. So asymmetric information, um, while it's something that we seek after, it's not something that helps the market clear prices. So when I think about the market, I hope you guys start to, after taking this class, have a different appreciation for supply and demand in a way, that there's a market for every good, in a voluntary market, we have people that are selling things and people that are buying things, and they have opposite interests, right? And through competition, the market ends up creating a price. That price can change depending on behavior when we learn about supply shifters or demand shifters and things that move that around. But that's the market system at work that's embodying information. And so if there's equal information or approximately equal information, then the price that the market kicks out 
is an efficient one for society. It actually makes the maximum amount of people happy if you want to think about it that way. When we have that information, the market system, capitalism, is working well at taking scarce resources of land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship and moving those resources to higher valued places, right? Your author in the tech, textbook talked about that, of how we're moving to higher values, right? The, the market system is always groping and seeking like these profit opportunities. What we're really doing is we're trying to serve consumers what they see as valuable we're able to move resources from one spot and plug them into the other. We can't do that when we're under a centrally planned system of government that says, oh, I know what's best for you. You should have this, right? And so then somebody else is making that decision, which doesn't allow the complexity of the real world to reveal itself in that price. That price is really special in capitalism and economics. And when we have competitive forces, both on the selling side and the buying side, we should like sit in awe that we can go out to the cove tonight and have a nice cold beer for $2.50. I don't know if that's the real price, but like that's freaking awesome. Like, why isn't it $6.50? Because $2.50 is the right price. How do I know that? Because there's lots of other bars selling beer tonight. And there's lots of people who want to buy beer. And somehow the code has $2.50 there. That's the right price. That's pretty freaking awesome. Nobody planned that. There was not a government official, Trump didn't come out and declare that beer has to be for sale for $2.50 to make society well, right? It just emerges spontaneously through the aggregated behavior of individual people doing what's best for themselves. It just comes to be. That gives me chills. That's where I start to get goosebumps when I start to think about how awesome that is. Okay, so now that I'm off my soapbox on how awesome that is, that system gets screwed up a little bit because of some of these issues we're talking about here. And so before we do the deal, it's possible that we could have this adverse selection issue where uh, people who are seeking insurance, uh, as we saw in the last chapter, know that they're risky people. They like to jump out of airplanes. They like to cross traffic when, when the thing is flashing, don't cross, don't cross, or whatever. They know that, but the insurance company, even through all their applications and uh, Facebook stalking you don't know that you're really that person that's going to be running a higher risk of that crosswalk, right? So that was adverse selection. Now, moral hazard is what we're going to talk about first tonight. And so moral hazard lives post-contract. So now that we got the insurance policy, I might start to cross at crosswalks that I wouldn't otherwise do. I should show you this video that I have from Mumbai, India, of me crossing the road. Um, it's kind of fun. It's crazy in India, the traffic that they have. So, um, so you might choose to do some riskier activities now that you know you're covered with insurance, right? Whereas before you, you know, drove a lot closer, like, oh, I'm not insured right now. I better drive really carefully. But now that I'm insured, maybe I'm going to change my driving habits a little bit. So that is this idea of, of moral hazard. Okay, so questions or comments there? All right, so let's take a look at some other details here. Okay, so give this a read, and then I want to take a poll afterwards.
Do any of you have this? Have you agreed to let uh, the insurance company? You did, did you do it? You yeah. saved some money though, right? Yeah, not very much. Though. A little bit of money, but you, you had something, so they had a price for you. But it was very stressful to drive with that beeping at me every time I Did it beep at you? Oh, I didn't know it beeped at when you. I, when you break, when you, have, when you get a hard break, it beeps at you, and then the app shows that you got one hard break this week. Wow! Oh <laughs> really? I have not heard that. I've been lecturing this for a while. I didn't know it was beef that you. Uh, you must have the option of silencing it or not, or is it all fixed? Like they want to. No, because the device I just plug it into my car and then yeah. it's the wow. And then it records how many heartbreaks I get. <laughs> <laughs> so they give you a heartbreak. And yes. so you want to minimize the number of heartbreaks. Yes. And potentially that'll keep your insurance rates low if your heartbreaks are low. Yeah. Wow. I yeah. Was, I was touch, well, not touch driving a car, but I had a loaner car for a couple of weeks, and it had this system. Instead of going through the insurance, it was for their maintenance. So, okay. like for your brakes and stuff, if you, um, but it would tell you a percentage of how hard you would brake. Oh, like if you didn't do that, you'd save money over time. Like you, you would save. So you would save. Um, like so, say your brakes go bad or something like that. Um, if you save more money, if you now this was a loaner car, you said. Mm -hmm. So they were doing it as a service to you. It was well, to educate yourself. Technically, the the car that I was loaning was like a used car, so it was like an owner. It like somebody used to own it. Oh. Uh, but they were working on my car, so I had it for like two oh. weeks. But it like would tell you you had ninety, like you used ninety five percent of your brake this ride or whatever you had six hard breaks or uh, whatever and then I asked him because I was like what does that mean and he was like well whoever would own the car like it would tell them okay so oh you it's, you've only had the car for two months and you've used 60 percent of your hard break so but this was not on a car share thing <laughs> like Airbnb right mm -hmm. which they do have stuff like that too I can see them maybe Using something there, like they could charge you more if you use more of their car, up, mm -hmm. right? Like heavy braking, and it's like, oh, yeah. So uh, I've been avoiding any of that. I don't like that Big Brother feature myself. I will pay the extra money, and I didn't think it was worth it. Uh, mine was $150 a year or something, you know, $10 a month or something, but I'm like, no thank you. I'll pay, I'll pay the I don't want you tracking me and learning about me any more than you already know. So, so yeah, but that is what they're tracking. So this is a little bit different than the adverse selection because now what they're trying to do is to change your behavior post-contract, right? So by having that device and signaling that, they found that they'll have people break better and in theory be safer or whatever because they know they're being watched. And of course, um, maybe the adverse selection part is who chooses to do that in general? Who chooses to take them like, oh yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that trip sense thing and get to save the money. Who does that? Careful drivers or not so careful drivers? Careful drivers, right? So that's the adverse selection problem is that people who like me are like, <laughs> Whatever, you're not going to be watching me. I'm not going to subject myself to that because I like to go a little fast and break a little heavy and whatever. Um, so they're, they need to take adverse selection into account that when they offer those discounts, it's probably people are going to do. So what does that do to the discount? Holding all other things constant. Lower the discount or raise it? Knowing that basically safe drivers are only going to pick that function. It lowers the discount, that's right, right? So if you're talking about the money you're going to save, like when I looked at it, I'm like, well, that isn't that much money and I don't want to, right? So if all safe drivers are doing it, it's kind of like a no-brainer. Like I always drive five miles under the speed limit and, you know, whatever, drive hands of two, ten and two on the wheel and whatever. Um, then there's not going to be that much benefit to the insurance company because what they'd really like to do is get everybody doing it on average, but they face an adverse selection problem that only the safe drivers are going to be the ones picking that up. And they have that will ultimately get priced into their product. 
I'm, I'm pretty sure when they first started doing that, the discounts were a lot deeper. Like it was a lot more advantageous, but then I think that's what they found out is that, oh, only safe drivers are doing this, so we don't have as much benefit. All right, questions or comments there? All right, so hidden actions are moral hazard. They're hidden in the sense of you're going to change your behavior once you do it. So once you have insurance, the cost of an accident is reduced. You got some other examples of moral hazard post contract where you're going to change your behavior after you've done the deal, whatever the deal is. It's kind of hard to divorce ourselves from insurance, but we can try to divorce ourselves from insurance. But if you got an insurance example, that's fine too. This one was car insurance with the accident. Last week we talked about the bicycle. Maybe buying insurance, you instead of always bring it into the house, just uh -huh. to get stolen, you leave it more outside. Good. Of that insurance. Good. Yeah, we're going to have an example similar to that, but that's a good one. Yeah, bringing it into the house um, instead of uh, leaving it out. Good. Other one? Maybe one other one? Based on your smirking, what do you got? I, I think I know what your example is. From, from previous classes? Yes. Okay, go ahead. You can steal my thunder. Uh, uh, then she used to park the car under a tree and the lid was on the verge of falling on the car. Oh, <laughs> yeah, well, let's not, this is being recorded, so let's not get into those details <laughs> exactly, but, uh, yeah, uh, in general, a person might not be as adverse to parking under a, a dangerous tree during a storm uh, if they know that they have uh, comprehensive insurance. And then, would that also go with the like how you jumped into the the cane? Well, geez, you guys are beating up on me now. I'm <laughs> jumping into the water last my butt injury. <laughs> like it still you're... feels slightly. It's mostly healed now. But, but because you know you're insured, yeah. rather somebody who's like not insured, they be a little bit more skeptical. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you know you got good health insurance or something, and so you might do this, whereas like you know you're. You know, financially wrecked if you didn't have health insurance to jump in the jump in the water. So good, yeah, that's another one. So all right, I can I can take the abuse tonight. <laughs> <laughs> all right, good. Um, okay, so here's the bicycle thing. We're gonna add on to that. So suppose that bike owners stand a 40% chance of theft on the street overnight. However, if they lock it up, theft is reduced to 30%. Suppose the cost of taking care is five bucks. What is the marginal benefit and marginal cost of exercising care? We still have a hundred dollar bike, but the example we started on last. So what is the marginal benefit of exercising care? Let's ignore the cost for a second. What's the benefit? If I lock up my bike, how many dollars am I up? If I have a hundred dollar bike and those are the probabilities. $10, how'd you get that? Okay, good. So you got 40% chance on $100 is 40, right? $40 loss, $30 loss. So you're getting an extra $10 benefit of exercising care. So the marginal benefit of care uh, is $10. And then what's the cost? Five. Five. So should we do it? Yeah. So we would actually, we would normally buy a lock if we weren't insured we would go out and buy a lock because it makes sense for us to do so. It's in our self-interest because the benefit's $10 and the cost is $5 at the margin. Okay, so once we get the insurance policy, 
are we going to lock it up? So this is back to kind of the original example, full insurance. So we buy an insurance policy. Remember, we had Rachel. She spends 25 bucks or whatever, and she locks up the bike, whatever, whatever her policy costs. Is she going to lock it up after she buys insurance? So what's the marginal benefit of locking it up now with insurance? Zero. And what's the marginal cost? Five dollars. Don't do it. Right? So hopefully if we start to learn anything about the rational economic mind, uh, which I would go to bat for here, is that all decisions in life, we figured out a formula for. Analyze the benefits of taking that action. Analyze the cost of taking that action. If the benefits are greater than the cost, do it. If they're not, don't. That's life. That's the should I brush my teeth this morning. That's the should I go to the cove tonight after uh, when we break early for class. That answer yes, obviously. But um, you know, every decision in life. Analyze those benefits and the cost. Are the benefits always known with certainty? No. So then we go into dealing with uncertainty, with possibly probability calculations, if we can do it or otherwise. Do we always know the cost with certainty? No. So we might have uncertainty on both sides of the equation. So really, the modified version is to say, Expected benefits, expected costs. If the expected benefits are greater than the expected cost, do it. If not, don't. That's every decision in life. All right, so we're going to pass on the insurance here. Um, and the problem is, is that if State Farm thinks that some of the people are going to lock their bike, they're going to misprice their insurance. That's the main lesson here for the insurance company. Is, is that if they overlook this moral hazard idea, and that like they did a study, and it's like, oh, 30% of all consumers lock their bike or whatever, right? And they're like, okay, well, we, we can bank on 30% locking their bike. This says no. Once you get the insurance policy, you're going to be in that fraction that don't lock their bike, right? So again, we can't look at the averages. We got to look more carefully at the information that we have at hand. Okay, questions or comments there? All right, so we've got a potential profitable opportunity. How can the insurance company induce the owner to exercise care? How can the insurance company induce the bike owner to exercise care? Just like a Credit or something like if their bike doesn't get, they don't use the insurance. Like almost like okay, kind of how like for drivers, like there's that safe driver. Like, yeah, yeah, I almost. think that that's been something. Yeah, safe driver <laughs> discounter. If you uh, one insurance company, especially who owns that, I can't remember which one it is. All states. Yeah, so yeah, that's what I was thinking yeah. too. So if you have a good record for three years or four years and you haven't been in a wreck or anything, then your rate automatically goes down. So you kind of prove yourself up. Right, and so maybe the reason why your bike hasn't been stolen is because you've been locking it. So if we start thinking of this instead of a one-shot game that it's a indefinite game that you're playing, uh, maybe offering some rewards down the road might be good. Good. Anything else? Other comments on how we can induce that? Okay, less than full coverage of the bike. So maybe we can play around with the numbers a little bit to bring that down to where their personal costs are going to be uh, outweighing the, the $5 uh, bike fee. So they would have to pay $6 out of pocket through partial insurance. Good. Okay. Anything else? Pay for the lock. That one's kind of questionable because you're driving the cost to zero, but their benefit's zero. So are they still going to use the lock, or you know that might not give it might not be a perfect thing, um, but uh, maybe we could play on that a little bit too. Do 
but survey your policy holders after the fact and then to try to determine how many of them do indeed block it up that way you could adjust from there. The problem with that is that collecting good information off the survey might be something, um, but you might be able to try to get something going to where there's a pool cost. So like if 80% of the people lock up their bike, then everybody will get a discount. Maybe there's some sort of collective action type of promise that way or something. Um, we could have a camera on the bike that shows proof that you locked it every night, right? Or whatever. In today's day and age of technology being low, maybe we can prove that you locked the bike um, when, when you get that policy. Who knows? All right, so um, for each of these examples, I'd like you to give me a moral hazard and adverse selection explanation. So drivers with airbags are more likely to get into traffic accidents. So give me a, at both a moral hazard and an adverse selection answer to that. Drivers with airbags are more likely to get into traffic accidents. Yeah, Jacob? It's a moral hazard. They might drive faster and you know they'll probably win. Okay, good. Somebody else with an adverse selection? Adverse selection. The more dangerous driver will buy a car with the airbags. They're going to buy the car with the airbags, yes. So now, I mean, this even this example is getting a little old because almost every car has airbags now. But <laughs> before, you wouldn't have that. Yes, so that would be the adverse selection and moral hazard. So uh, Volvo drivers are more likely to run stop signs. So a little history on this, because uh, I'm not sure it's totally true or you guys know, but Volvo's been known for years that they were always number one in crash resistance on uh, impacts. So they've been known to be the safest car out there. So yeah. That's so adverse selection would be like people that people with someone is more likely to run stop signs. Yep, got it. And what about moral hazard? They're more likely to drive recklessly. So it's kind of similar to the to the airbag one. Okay. All you can eat restaurants. Customers eat more food. <laughs> people who really like to eat. Okay. People who really like to eat. Now that is, is that adverse selection or moral hazard? That's adverse selection. So we're going to be getting people coming to a restaurant that love to eat, maybe more than the average Joe. Wes? Right. Someone who pays, this is their pays is more willing, or more likely to eat more food. Yes. So post-contract, whether you weigh a buck oh five or whether you weigh four oh five, um, you're more likely to eat more. Like everybody tends to eat a little bit more after you're at the buffet. Uh, because you're making that uh, cost-benefit analysis, you know, sitting at the buffet, you're like, okay, I paid my money, so what's the what's the cost of actually going up to the buffet line? Nothing monetarily, but is there any sort of cost? Yeah, you got that uncomfortableness, the actual physical effort to get out of your chair, waddle over to the <laughs> Line, grab a new plate, scoop up the stuff, a little bit of guilt that you have that, oh, I shouldn't be doing this, right? sitting back down, shoveling it in. So all of those are kind of costs that are non-monetary. So my point is that there are monetary and non-monetary costs that go into that decision. Like if the food was actually, if somebody gave, went and filled up your plate for you and brought it to you, which I've had done when I actually when I blew out my knee right here. Um, we were going down to Springfield, Missouri for my buddy's wedding. I never forget it because it was all you can eat snow crab legs at this Chinese restaurant. You know how like, once in a while the Chinese restaurants have like all you can eat snow crab legs. And I could eat some of those. And so they kept bringing plates and plates. <laughs> And I uh, drove them out of business. There was a closed sign the next day after uh, I got out of there. So, so yes. All right. So we all um, can relate to the all you can eat restaurants. All right. So shirking. 
This is kind of an economist word. I don't think we usually use too much, but sloughing off, chirping, looping up. So attorneys um, are often hourly paid. So how do we know that they're not, you know, shirking? What are some potential solutions to this? You can pay them by the project. Okay. It wouldn't really help to them do the ones they value more, but it would help the hourly cost. Yeah. Yeah. So having it be a fixed fee. Right, so they bid. Usually, it's a bidding process of some sort. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be a bid, like an open bid, like you get multiple people. But you just go up to this company and say, "Hey, here's my job, and you've got it pretty well defined. Um, and how much are you willing to do?" Well, we'll do that for three thousand dollars. And so that's it, right? You got a fixed fee. So that might be one way to overcome it. That's all. You could have them kind of give an estimate, and then like if they yeah, so similar to the fixed fee would be the not to exceed fee. So what I found with those over time is that typically they tend to go right up to the not to exceed level, right? It's like, oh, we just got lucky. It happened to be 3,000, exactly. Uh, but yeah, not to exceed. Um, where does this become problematic to give a fixed fee? Like, can you imagine? I know that some of you haven't been out in the real world for a lot of things, but um, so in my experiences in real estate, like architects and attorneys and sometimes engineers and uh, other things, like, hey, I want to build this building, and what 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 are you going to charge me for architectural fees? Like, what are some problems with going the fixed fee route as opposed to the hourly route? Do they have to work more than? What they probably put in, like they initially thought, like say there's an issue that arises. We'll use the contractors for like the halls, for example. Uh -huh. um, like they got the tubs, the showers, and but they were too tall, so now they had to go back, and so like that wasn't something that they initially yeah. thought would be an issue. And that could be like a change order in mm -hmm. the. So is that what happened? That our showers yeah. were too tall. Our showers were too tall. Yeah. So that could suck. So you're the installer, and they set the. The showers were eight feet and they come in and they're eight and a half, and you've already built out the soffit, the drywall, and framed it all out. And now, in order to get that sucker in there, which probably we can't return them at this point, we need to modify that soffit and cut out the framing and rework it. So, who should that be on? Should that be on the, the, you know, the installer or somebody else, right? Is that if he gave a fixed fee of $3,000 to do that job, we should have to pay for that. And so that's where you get into something called like a change order. Now, if we do that though, what does that contract need to look like when we get into the fixed fee contract of 3000 so that I, the installer, am protected against an eight and a half foot change? What's that? Yeah. So, how? How does it have to be well defined or pretty broad? Pretty broad. Pretty broad. So if it's pretty broad, like I'll, install, I'll install your shower for three thousand dollars. Or which one protects me more? I'll install your eight foot shower for three thousand dollars. Which one protects me to install the eight foot shower? More definition to it. So that's kind of the rub that you get when you get more uh, complex things. It's like you can't really predict it very well. And so if you are an installer and you need to take that variability into account, what happens to your bid price? Uh, uh, you have to build in those uncertainties, right? It's like, some guy walks up to you and says, hey, well, we're going to have these showers. And I'm not sure what it's going to look like, but how much will you do it for? It's like, well, under the worst set of conditions, I'll install any shower for $4,000. I don't 
I probably can do it for three, right? And then we can go through that probability stuff, like there's probably a 50% chance I can do it for three, but there's a 30% chance I'd have to do it for five if I get into the weird conditions. And so they're building that into the price, and so that price goes up if you can't uh, define things as well. So that's some of the things, and so the hourly thing defends against that. It's like, well, I'll do I'll do your architectural work or your installing uh, for thirty-five dollars an hour, and it's like, you give me an eight and a half foot tub, I'll install it. It's going to take me three times as long, but as long as I'm getting thirty-five dollars an hour, it doesn't matter. You see the tension there between the, the the two types of contracts? So it's kind of if you go the hourly route, you might run into this problem. If you go the fixed fee route, you might run into the inflated bid problem because they have to build in some of that uncertainty. And so it's a real tension that's out there in the real world on how you design that stuff. And so um, sometimes you might get clever, you might be able to come up with the not to exceed. And this is where if you're a long-term business person, um, you're trying to build trust and you want that person as a referral and to give you five stars on whatever Facebook or something well, it's Facebook is a star, but I can't remember, but whatever. Uh, so you're trying to build up that longer term reputation. And so you might treat people right and not just go for the short term buck. Like, oh, I could probably screw this guy. I, I really did it for 2,500. I said not to exceed 3,000, but I'm going to do 2,500 because that's the right thing to do. And this is where we get into kind of the morality of people in markets, making markets good and making markets more efficient as well, which might not always exist. Okay, any other questions or comments on that? All right, so lending. So moral hazard, um, we don't know what the borrower might do after we give them the money. So um, sometimes this, this is especially since we're talking about new construction. If you're borrowing money for a new house project, how are you going to um, handle the funds that you get? And so if, if the bank gives you, um, You've got a $200,000 house and you're getting a $150,000 loan. And the bank says, yep, Russ, we trust you. Here's a check for $150,000 to go build your house. What risk could the bank be running there? Post-contract, moral hazard, they give me $150,000. What problems could they run into as I go to build my or my $200,000 house? Spending it on other projects, right? And so if you're a developer and you got your robbing Peter to pay Paul, which happens, I might be guilty of that a little bit too, on we need something to fund this. Well, well, this project's just beginning, and so we really need to finish up this last one, and we've got a buyer that's almost ready. So if we just take ten thousand from that hundred and fifty thousand dollar loan and we kind of it'll all work out in the end. Is that right? taking from your savings, like to put in your checking, like, oh man, I'm short on this, I want to go on this vacation. It yeah. could be that. I mean, that's a different example. But yeah, here with, with the business, you're, and this could be illegal. It might not be illegal. I mean, depending on how the contract's written. Like, the banker, if they have a high level of trust, they might be like, uh, Russ, you're good, you're good credit risk, and, and we trust you with it. Uh, you know, you need 10000 to go do this project. I don't want to hear about it. Just get stuff done. But the bank might be taking on greater risk because if we do ship that 10000 and then that 10000 doesn't pay off, and I didn't even put my money into the other project, and all of a sudden the banker is out to dry on 150000 and we've got a house that only has 75000 done, that's halfway done, right? And now the banker owns a half-done house, and they've lent out the, uh, the 150000 So that's kind of the moral hazard with, with lending. Um, and 
if they face a lot of that, if the market is, is um, such that there's a lot of people who aren't as trustworthy, let's say, they can't offer as low of an interest rate as they did before. They have to build that into the price again. So prices won't be as efficient as they were before due to that asymmetric information problem, right? So not knowing for sure how that person's going to handle their money. Okay. So we watched the financial crisis video last week. Too big to fail. Is anybody too big to fail? That's a big question. In my opinion, no. For the most part, no. I, I think it's a, a fiction that people dream up. Um, I found in general human beings to be very resilient. And so if they go through problems, they can make it through problems, but it is important to hold people accountable to their actions. And so the idea of too big to fail is to say, oh, well, if, if that company goes down, then we have a lot of other people that are going to be hurt that were innocent in a sense to the, to the issue. Um, and how that builds up over time is kind of a question mark that I, I could listen to some pushback on that our, our government through mutual assurances of home loans and backing and other things uh, kind of built this thing that we should have more faith in. But uh, I think for the most part, having companies fail is much more important than having companies succeed. That might sound kind of awful, but it's really true. Um, we get a lot more out of losses. I think I've mentioned this before. When companies fall into hard times, they actually get a lot more efficient than when they're just floating with profits. You can get kind of sloppy when you're making a lot of money and you're not being very efficient, but it's when we have losses that we're facing that we can really tighten up and find greater efficiency. And hopefully the best people win. The people who truly have a uh, comparative advantage in whatever they're doing are the ones that survive through those downturns. So uh, I think it was Warren Buffett, um, a rising tide lifts all boats. You've heard of that thing. But when the tide goes out, we see who is skinny dipping, is what Warren Buffett says. So a rising tide lifts all boats. So if the economy's doing really well, like everybody's making money, like, oh, business is easy, we can all make money. But then when the tide goes out, we see who the skinny dip and uh, not being as uh, efficient as possible. So how do bailouts hurt responsible people, responsible borrowers? Okay, more reluctant to lend, so they might not be lending at all to somebody. What else? That's part of it, for sure. Dropping out of transaction costs, does it more regulation than previous Okay. Bailouts, I guess. So those defaults? end up driving up costs to the bank, right? Because those defaults have to be paid for. And so what happens to interest rates? They go up. They go up right? So good people are paying higher rates than they otherwise would have um, if we end up having uh, bailouts like that, because those costs have to be incurred somewhere. All right, questions or comments there? All right. That looks like a good time for a break. So it's 7.10, our earliest break time ever. 
He preferred to perform detrimental maintenance and not break down and expect you. But because of asymmetric information, you can't trust your agent to have it until you pass on those repairs for fear of being your daughter. So we can see that asymmetric information can impede trade and limit the great benefits of specialization through markets. So what can we do? Well, take a moment to think about this, and perhaps you can anticipate some of the solutions we'll discuss in the next video. Did you want to test yourself with like practice questions? No. Or if you're ready to move on, just click next video. So I wrote this down because when I've seen this video before, um, when we talked about pre-contract, post-contract with the mechanic example, I'm not sure if Phil falls into the neat box that he has there because does the mechanic usually do the repairs without consulting you? No. So, um, I'm struggling a little bit to decide if that's moral hazard or not. Um, not sure it is in the strictest sense of changing your behavior after you've done it. Um, it is an example of maybe some asymmetric information, that's for sure. But uh, how can you overcome that mechanic who might be doing it? He kind of hinted at it in the video. So check Go check with another mechanic, right? So you haven't actually done the deal, and so you can defeat that certainly with some cost because you might have to take your car over to another mechanic and go through a waiting list and whatever. So it might them knowing that, but you haven't really engaged in the uh, in the contract yet. So I think I might disagree with him on that a little bit. That it's it's kind of a funny case, but. The way he characterized it, if, if you haven't done the deal yet, then I don't think it'd be moral hazard. If, it's, if it instead is like what I do with my mechanic who I trust uh, here in Ottawa, is I just turned it over to him and we were in Guatemala and I said, well, oh, you know, yeah, just get it fixed. If it's, I didn't even give him a dollar value. I just, I've given him enough business over the last eight years that I know he would never like do a thousand dollar repair without calling me first. So. It was something, you know, whatever reasonable in his mind, I trusted him to, to do that. But there would be kind of that's potentially moral hazard where I've given him the green light to do whatever, and then he does more than whatever uh, was necessary uh, because he can take advantage. That's moral hazard. All right, any questions or comments there? All right, uh, let's see. This one is a good one too. In the previous video, we introduced the ideas of asymmetric information and adverse selection, and we applied those ideas to the used car market. Let's take those same basic concepts and build a basic model for health insurance. Suppose that potential health insurance consumers come in a range of states of health. For instance, the least healthy people might cost about $30,000 a year. That's these folks here. The most healthy might cost nothing to help them. That's these folks over here. Now, if consumers know this information, but by assumption, insurers don't. From the insurer point of view, everyone is of the same average health. Here again, we have asymmetric information. That is, consumers of health care have more information about their health status than insurers do. In this scenario, insurers have to price the coverage based on the average cost among all consumers, namely $15,000. But if the insurance costs $15,000, then a portion of the market, the relatively healthy people, they will choose not to buy insurance because the cost of that insurance is greater to them than the expected benefit. So only part of this market will buy insurance. The average cost of those who actually will buy is then not $15,000, but $22,500. In that case, the insurance company that tries to price at $15,000 loses money. If the insurance company instead raises the price to $22,500, well, the same dynamic is actually going to happen again. That is, relatively healthy people won't find it worth paying that price. The sicker people still will buy, and that will raise the expected costs to the insurer, and thus the price, even further. This dynamic continues until the individual insurance firm finds there is more price at which it can attract a set of customers with healthcare costs lower than the price of insurance. This is the same death spiral we saw before with these cars, and it leads to a market failure. As we saw in the used car market, 
There are several ways to find causality that differ from this type of model. First, the model we laid out would predict that the healthy people, those who exercise, eat their veggies, and buckle their seatbelts, would not buy insurance. While the model is predicting that the smokers, the mountain climbers, and the motorcycle riders would buy insurance. Is this true? Mostly no. The people who buy health insurance actually turn out to be the healthier people as well. Why is that? Well, those who try to avoid risk by eating well also try to avoid risk by buying health insurance. Our initial assumption that everyone calculates costs and benefits in exactly the same way is too simple. Once you account for the fact that people have differential tolerances for risk, you can end up having the healthier people be those who choose to buy the health insurance. This is called propitious selection, where the people who buy the health insurance are healthier, not sicker, than average. This can keep costs low and predict against fire. Another possible response to the adverse selection problem in health insurance might seem familiar. If you recall, we saw that services such as Carfax and certified inspections can alleviate the asymmetric information problem with buying a used car. These services allow the buyer of the car to have similar information to that possessed by the seller of the car. The result of this information is that better cars can sell for more and lemons can sell for less. Is there an analogous approach for people and health insurance? Well, yes, the health of people can be expected, just as cars are expected. So while consumers initially may have more information about their health than what the insurance companies have, the checkup will allow the insurance firms to get a better idea of a consumer's expected health care costs. And that allows the insurance companies to charge healthy consumers less and sicker consumers more. In the used car market, that seems like a pretty good solution. After all, better cars should sell for more and lemons should sell for less. In the health insurance market, that solution might work, but some people feel it is doubly unfair. Not only are the sick sick, but now they also have to pay more for their health insurance. Another problem with inspection is that it might reveal too much information, thereby rendering health insurance no longer viable. For instance, let's say there's a very good diagnostic test, and it determines that a patient A has cancer, and then B, we know that cancer will cost $1 million to treat. Now, to insure against that cancer, the price of the policy has to be about $1 million. But that's no longer insurance, that's just presenting the patient with a bill. Insurance is protecting against unexpected sales of bills, and it's a kind of risk pool. You're kind of protecting yourself against the high bill. And if you're getting the high bill no matter what, when you say, well, then you lost those benefits of insurance. Another solution to the adverse selection problem, one used extensively in the United States, is group health insurance through employers. Most people in America don't purchase insurance directly. Instead, their employer purchases for them as part of the plan. The benefit of this system is that the insurance company doesn't have to worry about adverse selection so much. The employer doesn't know much more about its employees' health than does the insurance firm. Furthermore, the employer is going to be buying health insurance for the employees regardless of their health. So for these reasons, the adverse selection problem is much weaker with group health insurance. Group health insurance, however, does cause other problems. If you lose your job, you can lose your health insurance. And what do we do with our retirees? In the United States, various laws have made health insurance more affordable, and furthermore, retirees are insured by the government and their Medicare. So there are some solutions, albeit in perfect ones, as usual. The most recent approach to the adverse selection problem was implemented in the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare. Under the Affordable Care Act, everyone is supposed to buy health insurance. If you don't, you will be fined by law. The idea here is to force all the healthy people into the pool of those who buy insurance that will moderate the cost of health insurance, and we will avoid the death spiral. As you can see, although the adverse selection model is pretty simple, it has lots of applications to some pretty complex real-world problems. Next up, we'll tackle the model hazard. See you then. If you want to test yourself, click Rasp. All right, questions or comments on that one? Did you guys ever see the cool video on um, equipment, like especially football players, but it goes for other sports too? What's happened with uh, football equipment over time, over the last 20 years, like the helmets and the, the football players at our level or NFL or other, have they gotten better or worse? Way better. Yeah, go back down a little bit. Yeah, so, well, so as it got better, what should happen to injuries? Sure. Go down. But what a lot of studies were finding is that people were getting hurt more. And so um, if you know you're being safe and you're not getting hurt yourself, you tend to hit harder is what they found people doing. So as safety equipment got 
more and more protective and more and more safe, we actually had an uptick in injuries because people were starting to hit more. And so they found uh, when you were absorbing part of that pain when you hit, you tended to kind of balance that out, kind of cost-benefit analysis of me hitting this person hard and the, the, how much that's going to hurt me. So that's kind of an interesting uh, moral hazard case. Uh, all right, one last little video here, and then we'll, we'll get on. I'm just going to play the tail end of this one, because um, this kind of teases us up for this last chapter we're going to do on pr principal agent, which is brought up here before, principal agent problem. And so I'm going to play this one, and then we'll be. There's asymmetrical information between an employee and a potential employer. The employer doesn't know how smart, determined, or conscientious you might be. A degree provides a credible signal of these traits to use employers more information about possible harms. Why is it credible? Well, getting a degree is harder for someone who isn't as smart, determined, or conscientious. Here are some other signals to think about. Are diamond engagement rings just about giving your loved one something beautiful? Or is it also important that they're in costs a lot? What asymmetric information might this signal might reveal? Here's another one. What do some criminals tattoo their faces? What might be the asymmetric information problems they're trying to solve? And signaling is not only a human phenomenon. Why does a peacock drag around a large colorful tail, which might appear to hinder its survival? What kind of signaling are you talking about? And to whom? Check your intuitions in these puzzles and our practice questions after this video. So, now that we've covered our signals can help overcome asymmetric information, you might wonder are signals always a good thing? It might seem wasteful to spend four years of college or to spend two months' salary on the ring just to signal something. Students might prefer to learn more rather than spending so much time jumping through groups. And it might be better to buy something more practical for our potential status than just a ring. While signals do create some efficiency, they also generate benefits by creating more information. They help individuals and markets realize these from training and overcome problems of asymmetric information. So if you've enjoyed this video, uh, Give us a signal and please let us know. Drop us a note or leave a suggestion for us. Your feedback will help determine how we produce future videos in the future. For Hyundai, we installed a streaming cost of that. Hyundai did their cars on high quality, but the consumer didn't have that. The work in college was simply all about learning skills. Then you would expect that your expected wages would steadily grow as you completed more and more classes. For instance, when you would get halfway through the third degree, you would get half of the expected wages.
primary owner, uh, someone who's hiring somebody to represent them. So in that other video, um, they talked about hiring a mechanic to fix their car. So is the mechanic going to fix it as well as I would if I had the mechanic's knowledge, right? So I'm the principal, I've got the problem, I want my car fixed. I'm going to hire an agent who I hope has the same incentive structure that I do uh, if I was able to do it myself and fix it right or whatever, right? So that's the, that's the tension there. So um, with adverse selection, pre-contract, which agent do I hire, moral hazard, how do I get them to act in my best interest? Which one of these two is right? What's the right way to run an organization? Decentralize the decision making or centralize the decision? -making? Which one's the right one? Okay. So it's the famous college answer of it depends. <laughs> that, that's, that's a good answer, actually, with this one, right? So um, give me an example of both. So give, give me a real world organization or a real world situation where you think one applies. Not necessarily Jacob, both of you. You can take one of them if you want, but maybe we can uh, spread the love around here a little bit, too. You got an example off the top of your head? Or? I was going to say, I feel like decentralized works better in like smaller organizations up to a certain point. Decentralized with small. Well, no, no, no. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. so smaller centralized. Okay. So we're with centralized, we're going to leave the decisions with pretty much one person, right? So we're not thinking about my mom's bar. Like it just works better if everyone kind of does something pretty uniform. Okay. Versus so at sex, your mom is centralizing the decisions for the most part. Obviously, you guys can make some of your decisions whether to cut somebody off at uh, 1 a.m. in the morning or not, right? So not 100% of decisions. So all decisions to some degree are pushed down to different levels, but do we maintain most of the big decisions or do how much power do we put towards you know, other levels of management? So in a small business, most small businesses are probably more centralized, right? It's the, the small business owner kind of calls the shots and makes most of the things. It might not be very hard physically, like if your mom's there at the bar and you're like, oh, do you think we should cut Joey off? And she's like, oh, he's fine. He just lives next door. You know, you bounce it off of mom because mom's right there, right? It's like no big deal to let her have that decision. But as we have multiple bars in different cities, almost by definition, you can't be calling up mom, hey, I'm in Topeka right now, and should we cut Joe off? Well, I just got a call from Wichita, and they were cutting off Danny, and whatever. You, know, you can, you know, immediately you can start to see that you need to decentralize decision making the more uh, complex or the bigger your organization gets. So um, I like, to, with this story, I like to kind of tell um, Kevin Eichner's story with Ottawa University. So when he took over in 2007, the president's role, Ottawa University was losing like $5 million a year. Um, it was kind of a wreck. And so his first job, he was on the board, by the way, so he kind of saw things as they were transpiring over time as well. But when he took over, a lot of people thought, oh, he's being too, you know, too much of a power grabber, let's say, or something else. That's the right words to use. But, but he very intentionally centralized a lot of the decision making because it was kind of a wreck. And then at some point in time, um, he talked to the faculty and talked to other people in this town hall stuff that he did that 
after we've stabilized and we were breaking even and even had some surpluses here at the college, you know, that it was time to decentralize some of the decision making back. Like now that things are a little more together, we can, you know, push things down to lower levels with some of the decision making. So even Ottawa University, depending on the circumstances, it might be more appropriate to take a more centralized approach or a more decentralized approach as it moves through time, depending on the circumstances. So that, that's definitely more of an art form of, of leadership. And um, so what does economics bring to the table is, well, what do we do if we are decentralized, then maybe we need to look at compensation schemes that are more incentivized, right? So that we don't have the shirking, we don't have the moral hazard problem. If we are centralized, then how do we communicate to people? Maybe a, a quicker um, way of, of communicating information is more important. And so as technology evolves, um, it might allow us to be more centralized, right? Because now we have text messages and now we have Whatever, Pronto is the new thing we're experimenting with with uh, our Blackboard shells now for as instructors. So did, have you guys done the Pronto thing with other classes? I haven't done it too much yet, but uh, I, I can, within the Blackboard shell, there's a button, and then without having to say, okay, Jason, what's your phone number? All right, Joshua, what's your phone number? And I'm gonna make a group text message list or whatever. Um, we just do the Pronto thing, and everybody who's registered is automatically in it. And I don't need to know your phone number to push out a message for you that would be texting like, hey, class tonight was changed, you know, we're gonna go to the code uh, or whatever. I can push out those messages without knowing your phone number. So um, as uh, technology evolves, we might be able to become more centralized as well. Okay, questions or comments there? All right, here's a little example. I'll give this a read. So it's important to kind of get the concept here. So we have an auction house, and the auction house makes money by going to people's houses that might be auctioning off items, uh, whether it's art collections or, or other things that they have. And so ASI, the company, would send out the art experts to people's homes or businesses or whatever. And they would be empowered to negotiate a commission rate, right? So um, depending on the quantity of items and the dollar value of items, you know, if you just had a few things or something, maybe it needs to be closer to 30% because you imagine going to an auction, you have to all the setup time and the advertising and all of that stuff, whether there's 100 items or whether there's 10 items. Um, it's going to be maybe about the same amount of work. So you got that whole fixed cost, variable cost thing that's working, right? And so the boss just says, hey, somewhere between 10 and 30% should be uh, kind of the rate where we want to be. And then the problem comes in, most of them were at this 10%. So they checked it out and they found out, hey, I'll give you, normally there's 30% for a deal like this, but if you would give me this wonderful item, I'll get you 10%. Right? So the art experts were taking art as a kickback in this thing. So what are some possible solutions for this problem? Okay, yeah, so more information, more accountability for them. 
Um, that'd be an internet. I've never heard anybody bring that up, Joshua. I think um, I'm going to give you an extra credit point for that. So, but today, since we were talking about technology and all that, so like if we recorded the conversation, and you can imagine, maybe it wouldn't be that big a deal. We do that with other things, right? So it's like, uh, I, my boss likes to record these. Is it okay if I record our conversation talking about the article? Right? So then all of a sudden, of course, you hit the pause button. Okay, now that we got that out of the way, I'll take that damn bag and I'll give you 10%. Right? And then, oh, let's hit play again, record. Okay, so 10%. So it may not be the perfect, uh, perfect solution. Um, but that'd be kind of a fun thing to do. Okay, good. Other people? Okay, yeah, so if they get some sort of cut of it, um, again, these guys were on a flat salary, and so instead, maybe if they got a piece of this action, they would be more inclined to get a higher rate, because if they get a higher rate here, then their compensation is higher. So some sort of mixed thing with compensation. Good. Anybody else have anything else? All right, so your author um, kind of has a nice three-step process to diagnosing problems, which I think is insightful. Um, so with principal agent problems, we're going to ask these three questions. Who is making the bad decision? So the outcome was we have too many commission rates at 10%, right? So what's the answer to question number one in this case with the art? Who is making the bad decision? Okay, the agent, the young architect, the expert, right? So that's the person who's making the bad decision. Uh, and you can see, like, if we have a number of people and we're not sure what's going on, then that's a good thing to start with, right? Who's making the bad decision? Did the agent have enough information to make a good decision? Like, in theory, did that young art expert in this example, did they have enough information, talking about asymmetric information, did they have enough information to make a good decision? Yeah, they're the expert. Presumably they, they know what the value is of the items and they can count it. Good. So that's a yes. Did the agent have incentive to do so? How is the employee evaluated and compensated? So did he have the incentive? No. Right? And that's what you guys are bringing up with me. We've changed the compensation to doing it a little bit differently. So that's kind of a, a nice way to go through um, different problems to identify where it was. So if we stopped at number two, what would the solution be? Did the agent have enough information to make a good decision? What would we need to do to fix the problem if the answer to that was no? Give them more information. So maybe they need... Uh, a database that has better information on collectibles and their values, right? So they need a better tool, they need an app, so they can go in and maybe they can just take a picture of the artwork and boom, it comes up with the last auction data from the last six months of what a piece of beautiful artwork like that would be, right? And so they have more information at their fingertips to be able to give a, a better estimate of the value. All right, so that's uh, that's our, his diagnostic tool. So let's talk Wiki D's. So a lot of corporations are set up this way. So once upon a time, I was investigating opening up a Buffalo Wild Wings at this um, real estate that we had available. And so I looked at their franchise fee, we kind of got into it. And so then I learned Buffalo Wild Wings has um, corporate owned stores, and then they have franchisee owned stores, right? So that's the difference if you guys are familiar with franchises. Sometimes they'll be corporate stores and others can be uh, franchisee-owned stores, which is just a, a person who decides they want to open it. Sometimes they have restrictions like 
they'll restrict the territories, which I think is what I've learned in Buffalo Wild Wings. Like they wanted to get somebody who would take the whole state of Iowa. So not just one Buffalo Wild Wings store, but rather you have rights to the whole state of Iowa to open them up. Um, so th th different arrangements. Um, so subway stores um, are that way. Um, so what sort of uh, issues do we have in terms of what we've been talking about, your principal agent problem with standards and franchise fees? The issue here. And you can think of this being a company owned store or a franchisee store in terms of principal agent issues at either. Both of them have different types of problems, potentially. Well, the franchisees don't want to try to cut corners to like cut costs. Okay. So maybe they hire poor employees or something or like lesser employees. Yeah, and it might depend. I, I wouldn't say carte blanche that they would want to do that, but what do higher quality food, what does that do in terms of cost? Higher cost or lower cost if you have higher higher. quality? Higher quality means usually higher cost, right? And so, yeah, they're, they're going to want to, there's a standard that needs to be met, but it's possible that the company store would say, you need to order this level of oil and the franchisee might say, well, I can maintain that standard by buying this product, but Big Brother, the big company store, is telling me I have to buy from Cisco this level of oil or something, or I have to use this supplier, because that's the standard of the, of the, con of the company, right? So you might have that kind of come up where there might be some reasonable substitutes um, for uh, that could be used to lower the cost. Okay, good. Other thoughts? Well, that's kind of franchise e angle. What what kind of potential problems does the company owned stores face in terms of principal agent issues? you're a corporate store, what do you have to rely on that's different than the franchisee? Okay, so you have a manager, right? So you have a general manager or somebody that's going to run the store. Is that different than having the owner of the store? The franchisee owns it, right? I mean, they own the store. Is there a difference there between hiring a manager or having the owner run their own store? Absolutely. So. That's kind of the, the issues that um, they can face uh, between the two. So both of them have principal agent problems. The corporate owned stores might struggle a bit to find good managers because they have to overcome the shirking and they're like, oh, this isn't their baby like it's our baby. Um, and the franchisees uh, have some different issues that they're of course gonna have hiring stuff as well. Um, one example that I had with Subway, I, I talked to the Subway owner. Um, you guys remember when Subway started offering breakfast? That was kind of a new thing, or the, has it always had breakfast for you? And you didn't know that. Oh, there's they have breakfast, so they have breakfast subs. You guys, others of you, seen that? So I went into Subway and started talking to the owner and got into talking about business a little bit. He was so ticked off. Because um, I came in there at like 10.30 or 11, and I'm like, oh, I didn't think you guys would be open. And he's like, I don't want to be open. So <laughs> he's like, uh, he located his subway right next to the movie theater. So it's a little bit off the beaten path for breakfast, right? Because it's by the movie theater. He was looking for lunch and dinner with his subway location. But the corporate policy was, Everybody nationwide has to roll out breakfast. Like if you're a Subway franchisee, you have to offer breakfast. And so they basically forced him to lose money by opening up for breakfast when he's not making any money uh, doing breakfast. But he couldn't, he couldn't stop it without, and then he, had to, he was going to go through some, you know, protest or fight or whatever. So that's just an example of how like kind of the one size fits all doesn't always work um, across the board.
Okay, so to offset that, we could look at some sort of sharing contract. And this is similar to, remember when we had our discussion last week about part of your pay is a base pay plus commission? That's kind of a sharing arrangement in a sense. Um, if business is good, then you're going to make more commissions, but you still have kind of a fixed fee. So instead of a fixed franchise fee, uh, we can do a percentage of revenue or percentage of profit. Which one do you think restaurants, you guys probably aren't familiar with this at all, but just from the stuff we've been talking about, which one do you think would be better to do off of revenue or off of profit in terms of uh, minimizing issues of moral hazard? Revenue, why? Yes, it's a little bit, that's right. So normally these franchise agreements are off of revenue. And so you'll take a lower revenue number because when you start trying to add the cost into there, you got all kinds of games you can play with. Pushing cost into the next month or bringing them back. Um, you know, do we buy, what type of product do we buy? You can load the cost in a given month. So if you have a, a, a sharing system where um, you don't want, you know you're screwed, you're not going to make your bonus this month, so let's buy all the expenses this month, and then next month I'll get a big bonus, right? Because they, a lot of times, in a bonus situation anyway, they don't take away your money, usually, although they, they can be, you can kind of smooth that over time. So, yes, you'll see most of these arrangements based off of revenue, because it's usually pretty straightforward. You're having to report that into the state and sales revenue and all that stuff. So, Okay, why does McDonald's use company-owned stores along freeways, but tends to have franchises in town? Jacob? Is it because the store owners in the town would have more information about the community they service versus if it's along the freeway, you don't have that much real information? Okay, yes. And, and because no one would open a store on the highway. Like that'd be a company industry. Like it makes more sense for a company to do it because of the friendly costs. Okay. So somebody keep on, on the highway, kind of taking it that way. Everybody kind of agrees that if you're in town, then you can kind of handle your customers a little bit differently. You're going to know you kind of took a knowledge approach there, but you can kind of customize things maybe a little bit better for your particular uh, knowledge that you have. So what's true on the freeways? People like come and go, like if you're just passing through. Whereas, like, if you're in a town, it's like, yeah. you may be able to keep going to the same McDonald's over and over. Again. Right. But it has something to do with kind of like the hours, too. Like, on the highway or in a town, we like, for example, Fresh Shopper, it closes at like, well, all these McDonald's, it closes like at 10 or 11. Whereas on the highway, they'd be open 24 7 so that they can, they're going to get a consistent yeah. business. I would say the, the hours thing is going to be a little bit more of a, of a still, do, are we covering at least our variable costs? Like kind of back to that earlier yeah. version, like I'm either open 24 hours regardless of where they're at because of the volume of business I'm doing. So with the freeway business though, uh, I think Alex is hitting on here. If I get screwed, is it as big of a deal long term for my profitability? for the person who's passing through Ottawa heading towards uh, Iowa. If I get screwed, is that going to really screw over my business long term for the one person that got crappy service uh, and then they pass through to Iowa? No, because we don't have that repeat business factor going, right? So can I afford to have a worse principal agent problem at the freeway stores? Can I afford to have a crappy manager, so to speak? I can afford it a little bit more having a crappy manager on the freeway store than I can at the in-town store. Because if that crappy manager gives my, my townies bad service, then I'm not going to come back and I'm probably long-term going to be a little screwed. So I had this happen in uh, Estonia. And I like double cheeseburgers. I was kind of, I, I try to, eat exotic food. I mean, I had some great food uh, when I Guatemala and South Africa. 
But so I almost I have to preface that, this statement because I usually don't go to McDonald's, you know, when I'm in other countries. But I was kind of craving like just a simple breakfast sandwich, and I was going to take a walking tour, and I was kind of in a, in a hurry. So I go to the McDonald's, which was right by my hotel, and I was going to go run, get a breakfast sandwich, come back, get my clothes and stuff uh, for a nine o'clock walking tour. So I go to McDonald's at uh, eight. 15 or 8.20, and I put in my order, and there's just a few people around, and I was way back, and I do my thing, and I wait, and I wait, and I wait, and then more people come in, and I wait, and I wait, and I wait, and more people, and then finally at like uh, 8.35, 8.40, I'm like, I just had a breakfast sandwich. Is this one coming? Oh, yeah, 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 we're coming, and you can tell that they didn't know what the heck they were doing at all. Like, it was just crazy. I, I don't know what they were doing. Didn't know how to make their stuff. So then there's more and more people piled up. I didn't get my sandwich until 10 minutes to 9, and I had to go back to the hotel. I waited 35 minutes for a single breakfast sandwich at McDonald's. That just doesn't happen in the United States, right? So uh, I ended up scooching back and getting, making my tour on time. but. I was floored uh, waiting for a single breakfast sandwich for 35 minutes, but I was in Estonia and they don't have the same smile on their face that they did at the American McDonald's. So uh, that's just the way it works. Okay, so that's a little bit there. Um, so Dollar General. We got any Dollar General shoppers here? You've been inside the Dollar General? Kind of low. Uh, low price type thing in rural towns. Well, they ran into a little problem. Okay. So what's the problem? What's the solution? So we got Dollar General. What's the problem? Okay, we got too many stores going up. So let's go through the author's little thing here. Who's making the bad decision? Uh, well, it's a company-owned stores. They're using these development agents to locate new places that Dollar General should go. And they gave these generous bonuses. You know, they find more stores, so they're trying to have an incentive plan. If they find more stores, they can do it. So, the development agents making the bad decision on finding the new location, right? Did they have enough information to make the right decision? Question number two. Yeah, seems like it, right? I mean, if they're the expert, kind of like our art expert was. So did they have the proper incentives, the way it was structured? No, so it was based on 50 new stores. It's like, get a new store, get a new store, get a new store, ignoring the profitability of that store. So what would be some solutions that we could do? And for a like the years, we the books. Yeah, some sort of smoothing thing like hold back the bonus or that the bonus is ultimately going to be factored. So just a, a little bit of a tweak, but these types of mistakes are made in companies all the time. Like, oh, well, if you do 50 stores, that'll be profitable. Let's do it. Let's make that the, the benchmark without really thinking through um, how that might be manipulated. All right, looks like it's time to move our show.